الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولا كره المشركون وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الحاضرين إيمان faith is the greatest treasure and the greatest gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humankind for those who can read the secrets of faith Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Quran for those who cannot read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals his secrets on the horizon and within your own souls within your own nafs in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us I will show you my signs on the horizon and within your own selves until you have certainty of faith and for those who cannot even see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the capacity to smell it as he did with Hazrat Yahu Jacob when the false information was brought to him of the death of Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph that he had been eaten by the wolves his brothers brought this shirt and Yaqub alayhi salam upon hearing that Yusuf had passed away, had died cried, cried so much that his eyes became white meaning that he lost his eyesight but upon smelling the sweat, the shirt of Joseph he knew that Joseph was alive so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the capacity to either read, see, feel, taste, faith. That is the greatest treasure. The secrets of which are hidden all over. They're hidden on the horizon. They're hidden within ourselves. They're hidden in every act that we perform. Inshallah, this is the month of Hajj. And today's khutbah in the next 15 minutes is going to be about Hajj but instead of looking at it as we usually do in terms of what we do when we go for Hajj the rites of Hajj we'll try to understand some of the secrets of Hajj there are secrets everywhere because there was a time before time when we all stood in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in there were all of us, our forefathers, all the people who will ever be born. And indeed, it included all the awliya Allah, and the anbiya, and the nabi. Everyone was in there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us all, Am I not your Lord? And we all answered in unison, Alu. Bala, indeed thou art. And by that, there was established a covenant, a contract between the Creator and the created ones. Namely, we are all under contract to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having given our word that He is indeed our Creator. But then something happened, we all know what happened. We got away from Him through our father Adam we did something that we should not have done and there was a separation between the creator and the created but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite mercy he did not leave us alone he provided us guidance so that we would get back to him 
But in this process of separation were created secrets, many layers of secrets, and they're hidden all over the place. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam unveiled these secrets. He established not just one institution, he established five institutions, each one of which reveals the secrets. The secret, the hidden treasure, faith. Faith that takes us to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first institution that he established was the institution of Kalima. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Such a powerful statement has never been spoken by humankind anywhere, any place. La ilaha illallah. It first of all erases all that is out there and the opacity of creation. It makes manifest as if it is transparent. It says there is no reality but the reality. There is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is none worthy of our honor and respect except the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. The first institution. It is said that Abba Yazid al-Bastami, one of the greatest of awliyaullah who lived in the 8th century, one time had a dream. And in the dream, the Prophet ﷺ appeared before him and the Prophet commanded Abu Yazid al-Bastami to go up on a mountain wherein there were a group of flame worshippers. These people used to worship fire and partake, participate in their ceremonies. Abu Yazid al-Bastami was a little confused. How could it be? Because I have faith in my heart, la ilaha illallah, and here is this dream that is commanding me to go up on the mountain and participate in the rites of these people who are fire worshippers. So he doesn't do anything for a day. The second day, again, he has the same dream. The Prophet appears before him and commands him to go up there and to participate in the rites of these fire worshippers. This repeats three times, and the third day he's convinced that yes indeed it was a true dream and he goes up on the mountain. When he goes there, cloaked in the robes of the fire worshippers, he starts to participate in their rituals and after a while they accept him as one of their own. And time goes on, but then one day there is the priest, the chief priest of the fire worshippers, he looks at Abba Yazid al bastami and says, well, there's something different about this man. There's something different and he's not one of us. He is a, uh, a spy that has been sent to find out what we do in here. So they catch hold of him and they make him repent. And they say, well, now we are going to burn you. We are going to put you in the state. We are going to get rid of you. Abba Yazid al bastami says to them, sir, I will accept your punishment if you answer one question. He says, okay, that's fair enough. <coughs> and what's the question? Abba Yazid al-Bastami asked the chief of the priest, what is the secret, the key to heaven? What is the secret to heaven? Upon which the leader of the fire worshippers is baffled. He doesn't know how to answer Abba Yazid al-Bastami. He's confounded. He's silent. Then Abu Yazid al-Bastami explains to him the key to heaven is La ilaha illallah. <laughs> Upon hearing that, they see the truth of what was recited and all of them accept Islam. They come into the fold of Islam. Such is the power of La ilaha illallah. Never in human history have been more powerful words spoken than La ilaha illallah, which is not complete until we recite the latter part of it, Muhammad Rasulullah. So many people, when they recite La ilaha, even they say, even shaitan says La ilaha illallah. But he does not say Muhammad Rasulullah. So many disbelievers say La ilaha illallah, but they don't say Muhammad Rasulullah. It is not complete until we say Muhammad Rasulullah. And we speak of Muhammad Rasulullah, are we talking about our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as he appeared on this earth? Are we talking about what he was like when he was an Nuri Muhammad, the light of Muhammad? 
at the very inception of creation, perhaps even before the creation of Adam alayhi salam, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. That's the secret that is encapsulated in the ayah in the Quran, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the angels send the darud all the time. Inna Allah malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhalladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa tasliman How is it possible for all of the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send the salawat all the time? How is it possible? Because it transcends time. It transcends creation. It transcends even the creation of Adam alayhi salam. That's the secret. The first institution established by our Prophet Kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It is the, the cleaner that cleans our heart. It is the embalming thing that enables our heart to realize what peace is like. It is what enables us to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to see through creation for what it really is, namely that it is transparent. It does not even exist. But the impressions, the, 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 the distractions, the impressions of this world, the akhira is better and is everlasting. The second institution that was established by our Prophet ﷺ was the institution of Salat. Salat is a beautiful institution because it brings us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only relationship, appropriate relationship between man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of sajda. It is not one of any other relationship. The only appropriate, proper relationship between man and God is when man is in sajda. It is in sajda that you are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest of human beings who ever lived, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went up into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He stood in his presence. How far or how close was he? Aba Hausayan wa Adna. Two bows length or less. Two bows length, not measured this way. If you're a scientist, you would know two bows length. You form a circle around it. And if you put a point at the rotation of the circle, namely a, a, a sphere, and you pour energy into it, you have a singularity. And you can imagine a singularity upon which you have energy being poured from every different direction. What happens to the zara, that atom? That atom becomes so powerful that it cannot contain contain within itself and it will explode. It cannot contain within itself and hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches alam nashrah laka sadra. Have I not expanded thee thy breast because it cannot be contained and it has to be expanded. The heart of the Prophet sallallahu had to expand to contain the energy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poured into him and after meeting with him what was it that he brought back? What was it that he brought back? Did he bring back the well of the heavens and the earth? Did he bring back all the sapphires and the diamonds and the oil and, and the GNP and the GDP? No. He brought back Salah. Five times prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him, you go back and ask your Ummah to pray. And there are many stories about that, but ultimately it settles it five times. There is no proper relationship with man and God except the relationship which exists when man is in a state of sajda, when he surrenders. There is no me and him, no. There is no such thing as a me, because it is when the me disappears that the he appears, who Allah. The third institution that our Prophet ﷺ established was that of fasting in the month of Ramadan which is compulsory, obligatory, and the secret of fasting is consciousness of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that you may learn taqwa. Taqwa is a very pregnant word, beautiful word. As are all the words of the Quran, they cannot be described in one lecture or one, one single standing in here. They take volumes. Then the fourth institution 
that our Prophet ﷺ established was one of zakat, the secret of zakat is purity, purification. Purification of wealth, purification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, wealth is not ours. There are so many capable people, so many PhDs all over the world who do not have any money. And so many people who have no qualifications at all, who are very wealthy. Wealth is not something that you earn. It doesn't belong to you. It is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a risk so that through, he, through it, he may test what we do with it. So that when we give, we are giving back what doesn't belong to us. It's, it's not ours. Nothing is ours. The life is not ours. What we own is not ours. It all belongs to him. That was the fourth institution. And then the fifth institution, that's the institution of Hajj. Whereas the institution of prayer establishes the relationship between man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between insan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the proper relationship. Whereas that relationship takes us to the secret that is resident within each one of us. Every one of us is born with the light, the light that comes to us through the reflection of Anur Muhammadi. And the gist of our struggle in life is to find that light. And we cannot find that light until we efface the other part of it, which is our ego. When the ego is effaced, when we are dead, dead unto ourselves, that's when the beauty, the brilliance of that light shines upon us. So the discovery of that light within ourselves is the first secret. That is the secret of the individual. That secret comes from the se a higher secret. The word in Arabic for secret is sir. This vocabulary is uncommon these days. The vocabulary these days is so facile. Language itself has so become so facile that mankind has forgotten how to even describe the transcendent thoughts that used to be described in the old days by the awliya Allah and by the prophets. No, we don't even have the vocabulary. We don't use the vocabulary anymore. The first sir is the sir, the secret of the self, to discover that. Man arafa nafsahu fahad arafa rabbahu. So is the hadith of the Prophet He who knows himself knows his rabb. It's not that easy. That is a journey that only the initiated take, but it's a journey that we must all undertake. Then there is a higher secret, the secret of Adam, and that's the secret that is hidden in the Hajj. And what is the secret? The secret is really not that much of a secret. It is established whether you're a scientist or a Sufi or a Sheikh, doesn't matter, it's established. It is common knowledge these days that we are all born from the same parents. Through the DNAs and the RNAs, it's been established. It's no longer a debatable point. All of us, the human genera, have our origin from the same person, the single person, from a single couple, Adam and Hava. We forgotten that. Hajj reminds us of our common origin. So, when the Haji undertakes his Hajj, when he dons the two pieces of unsewn cloth, the ihram, when he duffs everything else, when he drops everything else, as did Musa alayhi salam, when he was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to draft staff. Musa alayhi salam was asked, what do you do with your staff? He said, well, I use my staff to shake the trees so that I can take the leaves and feed the sheep. And what else do you do with it? I use my staff to tend my sheep. And what else do you do with it? I use it to lean, to support myself. Comes down the order, throw your staff. And Musa alayhi salam throws this staff on the ground. And what, does, what happens to the staff? It becomes a snake. You can think about this parable in the Quran. So, so many different ways at multiple levels. You can say, what happens is that when you drop all of your attachments to the world, it shows up as a snake because the world is nothing but a snake. It is a deception. It is something that ought not to be, but it is there so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test us through it 
so that we can fulfill his commandments and rise up to the highest potential that we have. Lahad khalaqna insana fi ahsani tafeen. That is the reason it is there. So Musa alayhi salam then is ordered, pick up the staff once again. He picks it up. Again, one can interpret it many different ways. So you see the, the duffing, the removal of the clothes and donning of the ihram is reminiscent of leaving behind all of our attachments to the world. Leaving it behind. The uh, second Khalifa, Umar Farooq radiallahu anhu, at one point he said, life is a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. But it is something to which we hang on by a single thread. And people forget that. People forget that life is but a thread to which we hang on, as if life is everything. People get engrossed in it and are lost in it. So the pilgrim, he dons these two pieces of unsung cloth, and he says, Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik. Hearken thee, O Lord. I hearken to your call, O Lord, and here I present myself in your presence. And I'll be brief, because it's only a few minutes that we have, inshallah. You know the rites of the Hajj. The Haji appears along with all the people who are circumambulating the Kaaba, as it is Baitul Ma'mur. He joins the throngs and he recites the Talbiyah all the time. And then he remembers the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon humankind. And I'm leading up to the secret that will be revealed when we gather in the plain of Arafat. Very powerful meaning in there. Every single rite of Hajj has multiple meanings in it. The pilgrim remembers how it was that the Kaaba was constructed. Now, there are many, many different chronicles of how the Kaaba came to be constructed. One of them, when I heard, when I first went for my first Hajj way back in the 17s, was the following. He said, no one knows when the Kaaba was first constructed. The first man who appeared on earth built it to worship and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time went by, came the great flood, it was destroyed, and the house of God somehow remained in ruins. Then came a time in history when Ibrahim alayhi salam appeared on the horizon. He was a man who was driven, who was driven by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a man who was driven by that faith. Inni wajahtu samawati mushrikeen. Such a beautiful story. If you want to really understand the confluence of science and faith, read the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, because he was at once a scientist, because he looked at the science on the horizon, up in the skies, he looked at the stars, he looked at the moon, he looked at the sun, and he found them all wanting, comparing it to the sun that was al-Arif in his heart, and in a moment of illumination, he came to realize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Quran refers to him as an Ummah of one. So he built the Kaaba along with his son Ismail to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, as he was commanded, he leaves his wife Bibi Hajira behind. He goes away and the lady has to fend for herself. And it's a hot day, there is no water and Bibi Hajira looks for water. There is no water. She goes up on a hill, looks this way, there is no water. Then she runs from one hill to the other, no water. Seven times it is related she ran from one hill to the other until she finds that where there was the baby, Ismail, lying there right next to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a spring comes forth from the rock. Again, there, you see, the, the meanings are multiple. Just as water springs forth from a rock, springs sometimes the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hardest of the hearts. How often do we see people who, whose hearts are so hard and yet one day they get transformed and they become like as if he's a wali. Haven't we seen that in prisons? Haven't we seen that in people? All their lives they do some things and all of a sudden they are completely transformed. So, Hazrat Hajira looks at 
the water and she says, Zumi ya Mubaraka, stop, O oh blessed water. And the pilgrim drinks of that water. And to retrace the steps of Bibi Hajra, he goes back and forth, does the sa'i. Sa'i means struggle, the struggle again, the struggle. The meaning of sa'i is struggle, so that we struggle throughout lives to find that which we have lost. The secret, the secret of the pleasure of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then on the day that he is moving along with millions of other people, he goes to Mina, he parks in there, he sleeps over there. On the ninth of Zulhaj, he gets up in the morning and to the cries of Allahu Akbar, they all get up and they move towards the plain of Arafat. The plain of Arafat is the Hajj. And to contemplate as to what Arafat means. Arafat consists of three letters. Ayn, Re, and Fe. The Ayn is Ilm. The Re is Ruya, to witness, to see. And the Fe is the Fahima, to comprehend. That is, to know the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to see him as if we see him with our own eyes, you don't see him, and that is the meaning of the hadith when Jibreel alayhi salam appears before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and asks him what ihsan is. The Prophet replies, ihsan is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him, and if you don't see him, know that he sees you. That is the witness, to see, to witness, is to be there, to see him, to comprehend, and to accept the fact that you have witnessed it. And then not only that, Fahima, to comprehend what it is that you have, the inner knowledge, the knowledge that we are talking about in here is not the knowledge that we read in the books. Any, anybody can go to Stanford, you can go to Princeton or Harvard, any of the universities, take up a book. There are great libraries in Princeton. Princeton has about five million volumes. That is not the kind of knowledge we are talking about. The knowledge that we are talking about, the knowledge in the heart, the heart of the believer, the heart of faith that opens up and reads Allah's creation as if it is an open book. The way Maulana Rumi read it, the way the great Awliya Allah read it, that is the open book. So the pilgrim appears on the plain of Arafat, but not as an individual. He appears along with millions of other people. And there, by the foot of Jabal Rahman, he remembers that moment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy guided Adam and Hawa to find each other, to recognize each other. And hence, in recognition of that, there is a pillar on Jabal Rahman wherein it is said that the two met. It's allegorical. Do not ask, were, were they actually in Arabia? Did they really meet there? These are the kind of questions that people who are engaged in hujjah ask. You cannot find what is in your heart through hujjah. Hujjah or argumentation, the ilmul ibara, has its place. It has its place in physics and chemistry and mathematics in understanding in limited time how things function so that we can use them for our benefit. That is technology, alhamdulillah, that is good. But you cannot get to the heart through Ilmul Hijjah. You cannot argue your way. Because the Pharaoh was a great argumentator. You read the Quran. He was very good in argumentation. But his argumentations did not lead him to find the truth. The truth is a moment of illumination, is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they found each other. And hence, we remember the ayah from the Quran. Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, O oh, humankind, we create white man. There is no black man and a white man there. Where in this gathering is the Arab and the non-Arab? There is no Arab and non-Arab there. Where is in this gathering is the African and the European? There is no African and the European there. Where in this gathering is anyone except the created one standing in supplication before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with two unsown pieces of cloth? asking for his beneficence, for his mercy. We, all of us, not just the Muslims, all of us human beings, 
the Christians and the Jews and the Hindus and the Buddhists and the believers and the unbelievers, those who lived before and those who come after, we are all brothers and sisters. That is the secret of Adam. And the secret of Adam lies in what he carried, namely the light that comes to him from a higher source, because there is a secret that's even higher than the secret of the creation of Adam and Salam. Inshallah, we can cover it in some <coughs> other discourse. The Hawlu Hawlu Haza Wastafirullah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Very often it is asked of us by people who are not in the fold of Islam to tell them what Islam is all about. And I tell them Islam is all about faith. Because within faith there is love. There is compassion, there is mercy, there is forgiveness, there is the presence of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the basis of all knowledge. That is what Islam is. And there is no better occasion than, than, to, than the occasion of the Hajj to reveal the inner meaning of Islam. Because the Quran has an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Both of them are good, alhamdulillah. We have to understand it according to our capacity. Just as nature has an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Mathematics has an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Geometry, there's a geometry functional and geometry super, supernal. When you look at the Taj Mahal, you can marvel at how much marble was used in the construction of the Taj Mahal. Or you can go into geometry supernal and understand the love that went into its construction. The love that comes from trust, from belief, from faith, the faith that animated the king, which he borrowed from Ibn al-Arabi. That is Islam. Islam is faith. Within faith, there is love, there is beauty, there is goodness, there is falah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna Allah malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima innaka hamidun majeed Let us pray bismillahi rahmani rahim Allahumma ansurna nasan adhida wa aftah lana fathan qariba Allahumma jalana min ladunka baliya Allahumma jalana min ladunka sultana nasira wa aktubu sahata wa salama والعفو والعافية والنصرة علينا وعلى الهجاد والزوار والوزار والمجاهدين والمقيمين والمسافرين في برك وبحرك وجلك من أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم جميعين وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاع القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم الله لكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله يكبر والله يعلم ما تسمعون Welcome.